So anyway, let's get started. Um, hi, that's me. I'm Michelle, and um, I design stuff. And usually that stuff is WordPress. But I'm not important. I want to know a little more about you guys. So um, who in here is a designer? Do they design designing stuff? OK, cool, cool. Who in here is like a developer? Any developers? Oh, yeah, welcome. Awesome, awesome. Who in here like is a business owner or they have a website, but they're not a designer or a developer? Who in here got lost and found the cupcakes and thought they'd stick around? Anyone? <laughs> yeah, right? OK. <laughs> awesome. So like I said, I'm a designer. Um, and what that usually means is I deal with what stuff looks like, right? Um, but like many people in my profession, I usually get pretty caught up in the details, like all the geeky stuff that I'm into, like typefaces and colors and visuals and user interfaces. Uh, but I like to step back and think about, like, what am I really doing? And what I'm really doing is I'm making it better when people visit your website. So that leads us to kind of the first question, and that is, uh, why do people visit websites? So this is audience participation, so raise your hand. Like, why do people go to websites? Why? Information. Yeah. We need to find information on something. Find information? What else? Solve problems. Solve problems? Yeah. Buy things. Buy things? That's good. Anything else? Anything? All right, so pretty much... Find value. Right? Find value, yeah. So what's, what do all those things have in common? So people are going there to do something, right? They're going to take action. They're going to do something. And there is a word in the English language called a verb. And a verb is a word that represents an action or a state of being. That is what a verb is. And you may recognize some verbs uh, that have to do with websites. Some of these verbs, you might have seen them before. You might have gone to a website to do some of these things. That's why we're there. So then the, the question I like to ask when I'm doing some work with clients is like, why are people visiting your website specifically? And oftentimes, I get people trying to come back and claim lots of reasons at once. So they might be like, oh, well, I want people to like come buy something, and they have to get an account, and I want them to contact me, and I really want them to sign up for my newsletter, and blah, blah, blah. To think about web design effectively, you have to remember that your website has one single primary verb, and everything else is secondary. And to figure out what that is, you know, try to ask yourself, like, why are people coming to my site? And if you have to try to describe that in more than a couple words, ask yourself why. There's a good exercise where it's like, ask yourself why five times to get to the core of what you're, what you're, yeah. So do that. And you'll usually end up with one of these singular words as to what people are doing on your website. And this thing is your primary win. It's your main call to action. It is like... If people come to my website and they do this one thing, that is a win, this is a success. And everything else on your website, people can do multiple things on websites, but all those other things are supplemental and should be treated as such when you're making design decisions. And what design should be doing is supporting your verb. You should be helping people do that verb thing when you make these design decisions. As a matter of fact, what you really want to do is make it super easy for people to do those things. And at best, we actually want it to be delightful. We want to make it not only easy, but we want to make it awesome for people to do those things. Now, there's a principle in design. It's kind of a ideal, and it's called the zero interface. And what the zero interface is, is it means there is no interface at all. You just think of something and it happens. And now we're, we have not perfected telepathic UI yet, so we do still have to design interfaces, which means I still have a job. That's pretty cool. Um, but what we want to do is we want to get as close to the zero interface as possible. We want to make it as simple as possible for people to be able to do that verb thing that they came to your website to do. Good design is easy and frictionless. That means that whatever you're doing when you're doing design should not disrupt the process, and it should probably even streamline it. It should probably push people to doing that thing that you want them to do. Good design means that everything makes sense within context. So if you've got a call to action, it kind of makes sense, and it's supported by everything else, and your content is all supporting and leading people to that thing. In fact, you could even say there's like a directed path. So basically, where you came from and where you're going are clear. I like to think of it as like if I'm on a website and I think if I do this thing, I knew what, know what happens next. That means I've got a pretty good directed path. I know exactly where I'm supposed to be going. And in design, you 
want to have like consistency and take advantage of patterns. So not only do you want your language and your actions to match, so you want to use the same language in one site as the other. If someone clicks on a certain button in one place, it should do the same thing in another place. You should use color uniformly. So like if you're using color to mean links, don't suddenly use it on something that's not clickable. And don't break convention for no reason. Like follow patterns if you have good reasons to do that. But even if you're following like all of these good things, even with good design, you'll inevitably encounter this situation. Right? So you, you're going along, you're exploring good design, and suddenly, out of nowhere, a wild form appears. Because almost all calls to action, when you want something, somebody to do something, they're probably going to have to interact with a form, whether that's e-commerce, whether that's a social site, a government site, getting donations, whatever that is. Pretty much everybody's going to have to fill out a form. And people just want to do what they came to do. And forms are going to stand in their way. They really don't want to do it. It says, please don't make me fill it out. Yeah. And if they can't get out of doing it, they often want to abandon what they were doing in the first place. Like, they don't want to put forth a lot of effort. And so they choose run and leave <laughs> the interaction. OK, sorry. I liked, I liked to play classic Pokemon when I was younger. So. But anyway, forms are a barrier. People just want to do the thing that they came to do. They don't want to fill out a bunch of fields. And plus, it's really annoying. I don't know if this has happened to you, but this happened to me where I'm like sitting on my phone in bed, and I'm like, oh, I want to buy this thing. Cool. And I like click on it, and then it's like, enter your credit card information. I'm like, oh, my credit card's in the living room. That's so far away. That's like 20 feet. I'm already in bed. I'll just buy it later. Um, it's really annoying to have to find information when you're in the middle of an interaction. And so not only that, but it's also time consuming to fill out a really long form when you weren't expecting to fill out a really long form. As a matter of fact, they've done a study. Um, these slides are up online, so you don't have to worry about reading that really tiny link. Um, but there was a form on a, on a big e-commerce site that they actually, it was a, it was a sign up form at the end of an e-commerce transaction before you could actually buy anything. And it was actually costing that company $300 million because that when they changed that button, they made $300 million more dollars when they didn't require people to sign up in order to buy something. Um, and so form design can actually, if it's not done well, it can cost you money. Now, I'm a big, huge nerd who likes to read books about form design. And so there's a really great book um, by Luke W. called Web Form Design for On-Screen Use. It was written in 2008. So it's actually really fun to see the visuals of like Facebook in 2008 and eBay in 2008 and realize how far we've come. But he says some really smart stuff about forms. And the biggest thing he says is the best way to speed up the process of people completing what they came there to do is not ask the question at all, not even give them a form. But unfortunately, we do need to collect info from people. Like Some info is necessary, so what do we do? And there's a few principles of good form design. You need to balance the info that you need to collect versus the experience users want to have. You want all of everything. You want all of it. You want to know everything about everyone. And they want to give you nothing. They just want some stuff. And not only do we want to balance the stuff, but we want to try to add delight whenever possible. We want to try to make it kind of cool or kind of nice or kind of like, oh, what a breath of fresh air. First is use the absolute minimum number of fields that you can. Uh, if you need to eventually collect more information, let, it, let people fill it in later when it makes sense. Um, ideally, it would be great if you didn't have to fill out any fields at all, right? Um, but don't make the mistake of like forcing people to have to sign into something if signing in is not your call to action. Like if you're an e-commerce site and your call to action is buy something, don't force people to have to sign in to save time. Like that's not that's not good because like that three hundred million dollar example, that's what they were trying to do. But we do want to collect as few fields as possible. Um, when we're doing our information. Also, when you're filling out a form, it's pretty, like, you get an error, and it's like, nope, and you don't know what you did wrong, and you're like, oh, or, like, the error's at the top of the page, and you're at the bottom of the page, and you have no idea why the page isn't loading, and you're clicking, like, submit, and why? Give people contextual errors. Let people know, like, if something is wrong, what was wrong. Sometimes it's kind of delightful, like, as you go along, maybe, like, a little checkbox saying it's correct. Yay, that's cool. Um, or, like, a little, oh, no, you didn't quite fill it out right. That's, a, that's another way to add some delight to the error process. Um, but make it really clear what stuff is required, and make it really clear which stuff had an error when it was submitted. 
Also, create a deliberate workflow. So especially if you've got multi-page forms, there's a lot of multi-page sign-up type things. Um, make it really clear where you are in the process and what comes next, like maybe a step one of X or a progress bar saying you are this far along. And at the beginning even, before you fill out the form, um, Communicate like what information might be required to fill out this form. Like, would be really useful on a bunch of government forms if they're like, you're going to need your social security number and your driver's license ID like before I start filling this thing out so I can go get it or not fill it out until I have that information in front of me. And it does also help to communicate like this form might take you 15 minutes or this form has 10 pages. Really, really useful. Lets people be able to fill it out when they have time. Um, a little bit way of adding delight is if you can, um, being able to save user progress if they happen to leave and then come back, that's kind of nice. Again, it also depends on what your system is, but it's another way to make it a little bit better. Um, clear labeling. So obviously most forms have labels, but a lot of forms are created based on the database that the information is going into. And so we're just outputting it in whatever jargon we're used to. But we want to output it in the language that our, our user is using, not our internal language. Um, so we want to make sure that it's words people understand. Um, another delightful thing to do is um, you can explore alternate methods of building forms, like sentence-based forms. It doesn't have to be like label field, label field. It could be like, I am a blank who is interested in blank, if that makes more sense. for I've seen some really cool like Google sentence-based forms. It's pretty cool. Like, doesn't work for all use cases, but it does work a lot, especially with like contact forms and stuff, if you want people to feel like they're having a conversation. Again, another way to add delight. In general, it's better to follow convention with call to action words in general. Um, so we want it to be something that's clear and familiar. So if we want somebody to buy something, we probably want to use words like buy or add to cart, not like spend your money, like or like get it now. Like I, we want to have stuff that people are looking for. And we also, again, want to have consistent use of color, type, and shape for primary, secondary, and tertiary info. Like if I look at something, I should be able to know, oh, well, like this is probably important because it looks just like all the other important stuff. We don't want to be arbitrary with our use of that stuff. Um, I do want to make a special note about affordances and clickability. Affordances are basically like you can tell that you can interact with something. And the downside of like, I like flat design, but the downside of the flat design trend is like everything looks the same now and so it's kind of hard to tell like what's a button. So like here's like a progression of like less and less affordance. Like can, do we know that's a button? I don't know. Um, so that's kind of why the semi-flat design trend has started, where there's like a little bit of dimensionality to the stuff you can interact with. I like to use a, a combination of like a, a little bit of dimensionality plus a super consistent use of color. So like if pink is my link color, pink always means click on this thing and it never means it doesn't click. So that way it kind of helps people being able to click on stuff. Um, but along with good design patterns, there are also bad design patterns. There's stuff that makes it harder for people to do your verb thing, and we don't want that. Um, big one is conflicting calls to action, like not being sure what you're supposed to do on a page. If you are treating like, buy my thing, sign up for my newsletter, oh my god, contact me, oh my god, enter in your thing to win a thing, like, I don't know why I'm here, and I'm going to get confused and leave. Um, if I don't know what's going to happen when I click on a button or hit next or change a screen, I'm going to be like a little less willing to go through that thing. So I, I want it to be very clear what's going to happen when I do the next thing. You also don't want to collect too much information up front or, or get it before you really need it, mostly because it makes your forms way too long to fill out. And also it can make people distrusting of you. Like if you're asking people before they even want to go buy anything for their credit card number, like just to like, no, like they're going to be like, why do you need that? Or like, why do you need my address if I'm just signing up for your email list? Like, don't, please don't mail me anything. Like we don't want to collect that information until we need it. Along with that, um, forcing people to sign up for an account when not necessary. Like, if you're not a site where the primary purpose of your site is for people to sign up for an account, like a social site, if you're trying to do anything else, don't make people f sign up for an account. Like, don't make them have to do that in order to do something else. Um, I also wanted to make a little bit of mention of an anti-pattern of obscurity. So. Um, 
all these great frictionless design methods of making it really easy for people to do stuff, um, you can use that against your audience to like make them do something they probably don't want to do, like like subtle check boxes that are checked at the bottom of a form saying, I totally want to receive all your spam newsletters, default checked. Like that's kind of, 99% of people probably don't want that unless they're having a contest to see who can get the fullest Google inbox, which would be like this, a sweet contest. Now I kind of want to do that. Um, but <laughs> don't don't use these these frictionless patterns against your user. Like please only try to use them for what they came there for. So what we're going to do now is this is going to get to the fun part. We're actually going to look at some specific examples. So I have picked out three verb patterns, which are pretty common: buy, join, and donate. Many people are using those somewhere, and we're going to talk in detail about specific examples of each of these, and we're going to like look at stuff as an audience and talk, and it'll be super fun. Um, so let's start with buy. So when someone comes to buy something, what is the win? The win is when someone purchases your product, right? That's what we want. Like, yay, they purchased my product. There's a couple different call to actions we could have here. Um, there's buy and there's add to cart. Kind of a little subtle difference. They might have a little bit of a dim different implication what the next step is going to be. Add to cart usually means that you're gonna, you think they're going to get a bunch of things. Buy might mean that they're already getting taken to the payment screen. Um, this is just a little quote by Luke from the nerdy nerd book that I like to read. Um, all right, so primary info to communicate in buy. The biggest things you need to communicate for somebody to buy is you need to tell them how much the thing costs and how many they are buying. That is basically, I mean, besides what they're buying, those are the two things that they need to know. At minimum, you need to collect their name, their billing address, maybe their shipping information if it is a physical product, and their credit card or payment information. You really do not need more than that to be able to complete this transaction. Now, there's other messaging, right? There's usually photos of a product. If it's like, there are sizes, there are colors, there are options. But these, these two things right here are the most important thing that they need to know. Like, they want to know, how much is this thing? How many am I buying? Do they correlate to each other in some way? Yes? How many people back out of a sale if they don't see the shipping price immediately? I don't have those numbers. I put I, I do. So the question for the video, because I got the microphone, is um, how, how many people back out of a sale if they don't immediately see the shipping price? I actually, anecdotally, also would prefer to see the shipping price as I'm kind of purchasing a thing, or at least know whether it's going to be free shipping or not free shipping. I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's reasonable to not necessarily know the exact shipping price because you have to enter your destination to know where it's shipping to. But like, at least knowing that there will be a shipping price is, is probably good to communicate right up front. So here's some barriers that people are going to have when they want to buy some stuff. Um, takes a lot of effort to fill in your payment information. It's a pain in the butt. Um, do you feel like your financial information is secure? People want to know that before they enter in their credit card information. If they don't even know whether or want, they want to make the purchase or not. So these are just some barriers. They're, they're trying to buy your thing. Couple solutions. Um, for the unsure of making purchase, some places implement like a wish list or a save for later so that, you know, Amazon does a lot of this. Amazon's kind of a genius at making people buy stuff. So reminding you of that thing that you almost thought you wanted to buy. Um, some people solve the long form, female, uh, long form fields for payment info by using either PayPal or another third party thing that you're perpetually kind of signed into and you don't have to do that. Um, browsers have also tried to do this. I know uh, Chrome will save some of your payment info and automatically enter it if you let it. Um, Amazon especially does this, like the one click purchase if you have an account, very dangerous and fun. Like, Oh, just get it. Like, forget it. Oh, my God, it's on its way. Um, but these are some of the ways that people have tried to get past these barriers. So we're going to take a look now at Amazon, specifically. So I am looking for a women's My Little Pony shirt because I need another one. And uh, I'm looking at Amazon's page here. So what do we see? We see... I see the products, I see what they're called, I got some photos, I got some prices, that's pretty good. I see Prime, so I know I don't have to pay for shipping because I gave Amazon my money already, because they're, <laughs> right? But I, I've got kind of the information that I need here. What are some good, some good stuff? Is there anything bad, any bad things here? Well, I mean, there is a lot going on. 
We do expect that, though, because it's Amazon. The thing about the big player sites is, like, the more ubiquitous you are, the more you can kind of, like, screw with good rules because everyone's probably going to be there. But if you're a small site that's not ubiquitous, maybe you can't break all the rules that Amazon can break. Um, any other good or bad stuff that you guys are noticing based on what we talked about? If we're looking for a My Little Pony shirt, anything specific? Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that's uh, you. Like, that's good, because um, you can see what people think of it. Uh, I kind of wish on this page that you know Amazon has the like did it fit properly thing. That'd be kind of cool if it was on here. But anyway, that's that's good. We've got some stuff. Then we go to our single product page. What do we see here? So we've got add to cart. That's a understandable call to action. We know what that is. We've also got this one click buy now, eliminate all the friction, just have it show up. Oh my god, and it's going to show up on Thursday for free. This is so great. Um, we've got that we know what the price is, uh, we know that they've got it, and we know how to get it, and I know that it's free because it's prime free shipping. Um, is there any other like bad stuff or maybe like not as good design patterns or any good design patterns that you guys are seeing here? It's okay, participation is fun. Hmm? No color consistency, that's true. I mean, uh, all the blue stuff is clickable here, but it's yellow over here, so that's interesting. related items. Yeah, the related items, so that might be distracting, or that might be good, depending on, I mean, it is all more My Little Pony shirts, but that might be distracting if your related items are super not actually related, right? Because you're showing me more things I could do. And you know that if you scroll down, there's like the 50 other billion distracting things, like, you may have bought this, and other people have bought this, so that's not a good design pattern. But because it's Amazon, you know, they get away with it a little more. Yeah? I think in stock, because... If they didn't put that there and you bought it, you'd be pretty aggravated with Amazon. Yeah, that's that good. Especially because they do list things that aren't in stock, so that's good. Yeah. Social media. The social media, yeah, I don't. You're telling people right away. <laughs> Leave, your Leave your site. Yep. Yeah, social share buttons for, yeah. This may be like a little bit of time, but one thing that irritates me like crazy, like you're a prime user and they're trying to sell you on prime. Yep. If you remember your ID something I don't know that might be just to do to do what like not show those ads prime. oh well but this is prime now so this is like you already have prime don't you want to download that app on your phone so things will literally show up in one hour which I did <laughs> <laughs> hmm. I mean, other sites that I go to like I am a newsletter yep uh, signed up for it they're like oh sign up for a newsletter I'm like that's why I'm here yep I agree like, yeah that to me yeah, if, if you are signed into something, remembering the signed in people and not targeting them with stuff trying to sell you on the thing that makes them sign in, that is important. I always think that their font is too small. It's a lot of information and it's like small font. I can't really, my eye doesn't really flow I agree. They actually do not have very good typographic hierarchy in terms of importance. Um, yeah, I agree with that. What? The previous listing mm -hmm. screen, the rate, the price range. Yep. That can always sometimes throw me off a little bit because it's like, what's dictating the range? Is it the size? Yep. Is it Yep, so not, not super clear communication what is governing those ranges. I mean, with clothing, we can make an assumption, but with something else, maybe we can't. We don't know if it's like a color or a material or what. Um, I did want to show for Amazon, so I also incognitoed this. So this is what you see if you are not signed in. Um, so actually, pretty much the same. That's pretty good. Um, you can see like how the shipping works, which is good. Um, and you do have still the single add to cart. You don't have the one click ordering because you're not signed. You have to sign in to do that. Um, you can indicate they're selling, trying to sell you on that prime thing. But overall, this isn't too bad. But um, Amazon does make you create an account to buy anything. There is no guest checkout. So um, I guess they figure they can get away with that because they're Amazon and they are one of our big robot overlords and we will all inevitably have an account with them. But I wouldn't recommend this if you're not Amazon. Like, give people an option to buy your stuff. So this is actually like a bad pattern that they're using, but because they're big, you know, they can get away with some bad patterns and still make a bajillion dollars. Um, so here's another small site doing the same thing. So I want to buy a shirt, and this is the Cotton Bureau. Um, they're a little bit different because they 
they're kind of like a sell by vote type thing, a little bit um, <coughs> like Teespring and stuff like that. Um, but they're kind of fun. Um, so cool, like you can see all the shirts, that's pretty good. Um, I can't see what the price is at all. I have no indication what this is, so that's kind of not good. I have to click on it. Also, what's not shown is that the entire like top of the screen is like this whole other like kids promotion right now, and so I didn't even like it just as Cotton Bureau Kids, and I didn't know that I had to scroll down to get to the adult shirts. Um, but otherwise, uh, aside from not communicating price, which is a bad pattern, good pattern is that they're not they're not communicating too much else. Like they're not cluttering it up with much else. Like these are the shirts. Here they are. Would you like to buy one? Um, is there anything else anybody notices or does not notice about this? Yes. The font, no, the words are incredibly too small. Yes, words are very very small. Uh, it does look a little bit better on a real screen, but yeah, it's very small. Any. Yes, there is no affordances. You can't tell what's clickable. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we assume that the shirt is clickable uh, because we've done it before, but it's not like super clear. We have to like rely on past knowledge of, of other things we've gone to, or we have to just like flail around and click on things, which no one ever does. Yeah. I like how voting sites and they just have the click view where you can just zoom in and Cool, and I don't remember if this site has that or not. I didn't like, yeah, I didn't like do that because I didn't know what the Wi-Fi would be. But yes. I think too many just be at once. Too many at once. That's true. It could be distracting if you're looking for a particular thing. Uh, yep. Yep, so here is what happens when you actually click on something. Now, one bad thing, actually, uh, is that this is me. I had to zoom way out on this page. Like, you actually, like, when you get to this thing on, like, a standard screen that isn't a big, giant screen, you only see about this far down. Where's your Add to Cart button? It's all the way, all the way down there. That that's kind of sucks. I mean, if I saw this when I got on, I, I, I don't like how they're putting the Add to Cart button all the way down there. But... It should be at least right away. Like I want to. I know I want to buy this thing. Let me pick my size. Um, you don't have to. But other than that, that that's a pretty like negative because I had to zoom way out and scroll way down to figure out how to actually buy the thing. Um, but you know, they're you know they're showing like here's the materials to buy the thing. Here's the sizes. Uh, here's again, it's a little bit different than a normal e-commerce because it's a vote to buy, so there's a little bit other stuff they have to communicate, but I don't really like that that design pattern where that's all the way down there. The vote, like, stats should be in, like, a different spot. Mm -hmm. and it, yeah, go ahead. Is this a typical Woo kind of site compared to something in Amazon? Well, I'm actually going to use Woo as an example after this, a stock Woo thingy. I know I have a WordPress example for everything, too. It's this fun. actually looks like yeah, I don't. I actually don't know what's powering it. I mean, I like again design-wise. I like their colors. I like the fonts they use. I think it's pretty, but they're using some weird patterns here. That doesn't matter how pretty it is. That pattern's not super good. Yes. I do like the distraction-free interface. <coughs> yes. Like I have all these menus on top, all these menus on the side, all that stuff. I'm just focused on what I want to look at, and that. Very exactly. That's actually better than what Amazon is doing because you're just on this one thing. So that's a good thing that they're doing. Yes. I still don't see a price anymore. Yeah. Um, apparently, yeah, it's actually you cannot read it on here. So when you select, this was weird, and that's a very, I didn't like it. When you select the size, the price shows up in the button. Does that, that's not like a normal convention. That's not a normal convention. So you're right. Like, they're not, show, they're not even saying like, sh Select size to see price, right? You have to kind of know that that kind of design anti-pattern. Yes? You're going to um, show us how many photographs you should show when you're using the product, like wearing the clothes better, like people. I agree. Um, with clothing, having something at least demonstrating the fit of the type of shirt, even if it's not with your design on it. Yeah? I'm looking at the site now, and those are actually the social share buttons under the head to car. Oh, those little, like, things that you can't see very well? Yeah. However, though, okay, so I don't want to hate on the Cotton Bureau, because I actually, the next thing I actually really liked about what they were doing, so getting past the anti-patterns here, what was nice is when you did add something to the cart, it just kind of moved everything over here. So you're kind of, this is kind of a little bit delightful, right? You're still in the context of what's going on. You're really clear 
what you've added to the cart. It's it's bigger on a. I zoomed out for this thing. It's bigger on a laptop screen. Really clear what you added to the cart. You still have the context of the thing you bought, and it's really clear what the next step is. So I kind of like that. Like that's some good design patterns. And then what's also kind of cool is when you click on go to shipping. You're still in that. I liked this because you're still in the context. You see where you came from. Yeah, you gotta fill out all the the stuff. There's a couple extra fields like company. I don't don't really need it. Uh, it's there. But everything else is pretty much all the all the shipping stuff. I think they I think they hook up with a third party payment processor, so you don't have to enter. I don't remember. Um, but is there anything else you guys want to say about this, good or bad? Like yes. No what do you mean? Like you can't search for anything. You can't search. That's true. That is that is functionality that you usually expect to find on stuff. Yes. Yes, they did. They did change their consistency, so they're not being consistent with what a button is. That is that is true. Yes. I like that it shows what's in the cart in the like total, so you can track. Like yeah, receipt. yeah. I like. I, I just thought like this particular treatment of it was kind of a delightful. So like plus one to them, minus a few. But this this was cool. So um, I like the progressive reveal with the context. So now we're gonna do a stock. WooCommerce, like nothing special default installed. Now, obviously, WooCommerce, I have built many WooCommerce sites. It's very highly customizable. You can make it as great or awful as you want to based on theming. But here is just like a stock using their, uh, what's it, the storefront theme. Um, so you want to buy some shirts. This is their demo content. Um, so what, what do we see here? We do see some photos. We see prices. And we see... Uh, some buttons. So this is a little bit confusing because some of them say select options and some of them say add to cart. So right away I'm like, whoa, what like what is going to happen when I click on one of these buttons versus the other, right? I'm, is this one going to take me to another page and is this one going to take me right to my cart? I don't know. Um, is there anything else anyone noticed without design critique? Obviously, this is a default install, so they haven't done much styling aside from just making it work. But pattern-wise, anything anybody notices or doesn't notice? Yes. I don't like that the sale makes it not in line. line. Like it should go somewhere else where it doesn't affect. Or underneath it, so the buttons are all aligned. Right. Yeah. yeah. Line sure. Now obviously, that is something you could fix in actually styling it, yeah. right? So, yeah. It, I. I mean, I agree. I'm. I. I'm detail oriented. It's kind of my job. So I agree with that. Anything else before we go to the next slide? Cool. So here's like I want to buy this this shirt. So. Um, we do have a price, which is good. Uh, we have our options pretty clearly, and it's it's low contrast, but it like information wise, it gives you the number, it tells you add to cart, it gives you the price, it gives you the thing. Um, default, everything is kind of spread out. It's not super clear, but again, design wise, this is just a plugin on its default install. Although some people might use the storefront theme just as it is. So it's fair to critique what the theme is doing, too. Is there anything um, good, bad, or otherwise that you want to comment on on the single product view? Yes? The photo, it almost looks sepia style, unless that's just the view up here. But it's not very crisp. So if I was going to pick a color, I still wouldn't be quite sure what that color shade is going to be. Yeah, Wu picked some super hipster default photos for this thing. If you're if you're <laughs> yeah, if you're if you're doing product photography, try to represent what it's going to look like and don't you can use like the hipster skateboard girl, but maybe also have the shirt as yeah, it's supposed to be, right? Have the hipster like in action shot and then like the Right. Good shot. good for good for product photography. The button forms change. So add the card change. Yeah, we have different buttons, not not so good. Should be more consistent. Anything else? All right, and actually, then last screen is like now I went to my cart and here's what my cart looks like. Um, so this is decent because it, it shows up in a table form. Um, you know, you can improve that or not, but it's okay because you get a, a pretty decent subtotal. Um, but now this is actually super. Do you like how I um, took the screenshot on the airplane? <laughs> I know. I was like, oh, Southwest, why did you do this? Um, but now we've got two different buttons and we're not really sure like what our primary call to action is because here primary call to action was black here primary call to action was orange like which one's more important I don't know like I kind of feel like we should be consistent right because then we know like orange is always the important one and black is the second important one but we don't know that um, anything else anybody notices about this 
I like that they put the coupon code thing really easy to find. Because it's really annoying if I get a coupon for something and cannot find where to put it. I'll just like quit. The image is too small on this, yeah, that's true. Something that can be fixed by your theme designer, but this is stock. Yep. Yeah, but that's true. Like, so she mentions that there's an update cart button and it's just kind of sitting out here and you don't really know what it's associated with. Like, you might know if you've done this before, like, oh, probably if I change the quantity, but what if they put the update cart button, like, next to the quantity button, right? That might make sense, too. So, yeah, that... Yeah, like, especially if you change something up here and you have 50 products in your cart and the button's all the way at the bottom. Yeah. I mean, there, at, at the very least... If you have, if you're doing something, the button that is associated with it should be nearby. Good design principles. And then we get to the uh, the payment page. Now, obviously, this is with all their five billion options turned on. So, like, maybe not every single person is going to need all these things. But what I don't like about their default is that you know we've got all of these things up here, uh, kind of in the way of the stuff that we came here to do. I do like that they don't force you to log in, so that is good. Um, Kind of thinks that they have these huge, giant, distracting call to action things before we fill in our information. But they are only collecting the minimum billing and shipping information that they need. They can hook into PayPal or other things, or they can process credit cards other ways. So they have that flexibility. That's cool. Again, not faulting Woo for this. Woo has as many or as few options as you want it to. But just looking at their defaults, there are things that we can make better. All right, so that was buy. Now we're going to talk about join. So. What's the win for join? We want somebody to fill out the stuff and submit it. That's what we want. We want their info because they are the product. <laughs> um, and there's a few different call to actions, and it kind of depends on what you want people to do. There's sign up uh, versus create an account versus join. Again, you kind of try to figure out what has, like, what is the best for what you're specifically trying to do. Um, with join. Basically, the primary info you need to communicate is like, what benefit are you going to get out of joining? But like the super short one sentence elevator pitch version of why should people join? You can have lots of other information around that, but like that's your sell point is like, why are people even giving me information? And really, honestly, the minimum info you need to co co collect is just the email at first. I mean, maybe a name or username, maybe. But really, the only thing you need is the email. You can get people to give you more stuff later. Uh, I like it best if it's the, like frictionless and you get just the email. Um, obviously, secondary messaging, like features of the thing, data or numbers about your thing, all that other cool stuff. But if this isn't super clear, I'm not going to want to give you any of my information. So again, big barrier of social signups is that social signups usually have a profile, right? And so people want to know every freaking thing about you. But if I had to fill out every single field in my Facebook profile, of which they keep adding more and more every day, when I signed up, I wouldn't have joined because I'd be like, oh my god, they're so, I just can't. Um, and so we really only want to collect the minimum that we need to get them to sign up, which again, mostly could just be the email. Like even uh, with WordPress, when you create something, you often can have a password auto-generated and sent to you. You may not even have to have someone create a password at first. Minimum is email. Um, so let's look at Facebook. Hardly anybody has seen this page anymore, right? Yes? Join, what do you normally use? Is it just social accounts with Facebook or WordPress? Isn't that very simple? Join if a social media account. Well, like... You can, like, I like sites that will give you the option to join using a social media account, but like also, like, what if you are a social site and you're having people join it? So like, um, ha enabling people to join using a service that they already have as an option, not exclusively, because not everybody has Facebook, Twitter, or whatever. Um, that is, that's a nice like, non-barrier, because then they don't have to fill out things a million times. I like it like with... Um, I like being able to join things with my Facebook account that are relevant so that I don't have to fill out things again. I just fill it out once. But not everyone has Facebook, so we still have to have a form. So yeah, very few people actually see this anymore. But this is what Facebook's sign-up form looks like. Um, kind of, it looks a little weird here um, as Americans. Like email or mobile number, what? But obviously Facebook's audience is international. Not everybody has an email, but often many people are accessing their inter internet from their mobile device. So that's actually a way of them uh, making, making people be able to sign up without an email. So in their context, it makes sense. Within your context, you probably do not need someone's phone number uh, right away. Um, 
there's a lot of debate over whether you need to do the re-enter the thing. People are very passionate about both sides of it, so um, I won't get into that argument, but they're, they are basically collecting, they, they do have the, the name policy, so they're basically collecting pretty much a, a not, not too much information. They're not making you fill out the whole profile right away. They're just creating, like, they're just having you sign up for just what you need. So is there anything you notice about this that is good or bad? Um, I like, I think it's actually, it's extremely clear. Here's their elevator pitch with some supplemental information. Sign up. Like, nothing else distracting, not five billion other things to look at. So that's good. They're doing that right. Uh, yes, in the back. Uh, the, the label for new password implies that I've had a password. It's kind of a here. That's true. Although, you might argue that they're saying, please don't reuse your password from uh, another site. Maybe. I mean, it is weird. It's something that makes you pause. So maybe phrasing that differently would have been better. Anything else good or bad? I like that it says, why do I need my birthday there? Yes, that is true. Because again, the skepticism of like, why do I need, why am I giving you this information? That's, that's good. Yes? The call to action button is different on the bottom than on the top, but the top button on the bottom seems more inviting. Yes, so we've noticed that the, the buttons are different colors. However, I do think that's probably because they are primary versus secondary. Like, this is like, really, no one's ever on this page unless you've never been here before. So, this is probably your primary call to action on this page. So, they are doing that fairly consistently. Yes? Yeah, they are not indicating if any are required or not required. So, I'm guessing that, I guess we have to assume that, but they didn't communicate that. So, and I, I didn't go through to see what would happen if I typed, like, horrible things into it. All right, so here's another one that's super popular now, especially in WordPress, and that would be Slack. Um, very pretty. I mean, I will say, like, it is pretty. Um, unfortunately, though, this is another page where I had to zoom out to get the primary sign-up, which kind of sucks because they have all this cool, interesting data that I didn't really care about because I was already sold on it, and so I kind of just wanted to sign up. Um, but uh, otherwise, you know, fairly distraction-free. Um, what I didn't like about it is that this is sign up for free and this is create a new team. Uh, they actually take you to the same page and then they let you know whether or not you want to sign into a team or create a new team from there. So that's a little weird um, because I don't know what's going to happen when I click the button. Uh, what I did like about this is that it was asking only for a single thing. So at this point it looked good to me as a designer because it was only asking for one thing. What I did not like is that it was below all of this data instead of above the data and then letting the data sell me on it if I wanted to keep reading. Um, anything on this? Yes. Yeah. I mean, actually, this is weird because when it, it, it actually switches between their four colors. It's a slider. I don't like sliders. Um, it switches between their four colors. Uh, so yeah, it, the, the color scheme is opinionated. That is, that is for sure. It's an opinionated color scheme. Um, but they are trying to appeal mostly to like the young, hip tech company people. So maybe it's knowing their audience, maybe not. <laughs> yep. All right. So when you click on that button, you think you don't you don't really know what's going to happen next. You see, sign up for free. It actually takes you to um, one of these pages. There's actually four pages. Um, I do like that they're giving you an indicator of what happens. They also give you a little visual of what everything is. What I don't like is that they didn't tell me on the first page what I was going to be doing next. I would have liked to have known that there would be four more pages, even if it was just like the little indicator right underneath the email form or something. Because suddenly now I have to know, like, oh, crap, am I signing up for a team or not? Um, that being said, the good pattern is that it was, it was very well directed. There was only like one or two fields in each thing. It was very clear why I had to do each thing. And it did tell me like if there was already a team, oh, go up there. So it's a little weird, but it was also kind of well directed. Um, so that, that was Slack. This is a new, uh, many of us have heard of BuddyPress. This was a new one that just came out called Peepso. I hadn't really looked at it that much, so I figured it would be kind of fun to look at their demo site. I, I would have used BuddyPress, but I couldn't find like a really good default BuddyPress demo, so that's a thing that needs to be reinstated, BuddyPress people. I need to be able to, well, but I couldn't find like the sign up. I went on that, like BuddyBoss, and I couldn't find like what's the default sign up page. Like they didn't really have one, right? So um, here's the Peepso page. Um, what I noticed about this page is that you've got your login. Uh, how do you sign up? What is the 
This is a this is a, a WordPress powered social network engine. So you can use it to build a social network. This is their demo site to demonstrate how the thing works. Right? So this is, I mean, again, this is one of those things like WooCommerce where you can build it to look like what you want and integrate it into your site if you want a social network. Um, but I'm just looking at their demo, their demo of it and seeing like how does their default functionality work out of the box, right? So yeah, this thing is a button, which I actually didn't know right away because we've got the flat design problem. I thought it was just like a thing in the like picture and like I didn't know if the whole picture was clickable, it wasn't. So it turns out like this is the join us now, it's free. That doesn't sound, it sounds like a statement, not a, not a button, right? Like maybe join or join now without the it's free would be maybe better inside the button with the it's free being over here. I don't know, but that was a little confusing. Um, but I did like that, you know, pretty much they are, you know, log in, log in, like the demo is like, hey, log into this thing. Um, registration wise, these are the default fields that they're collecting. Uh, might be a bit much uh, if you like ha if you if you need to collect a name for whatever reason. You don't always need to collect someone's name right away. I, I really firmly believe that unless you've got like a really strict real life person policy, which most social networks don't, you don't need to collect their name right away. You can give them the option to fill that in. But otherwise, um, I mean, there's not not too much to say about it. It's a pretty standard registration form. Anything exciting or not exciting about this? Yes. There is lots of white, not too much to it. it, hasn't been styled, so you can use it and make it your own. I have no particular opinion on this plugin one way or the other, I just thought it was a good WordPress example. All right, last one, and then we can get out of the warm room. So donate, what is, what is the win for donate? It's where you collect someone's money, yay, win! And the call to action is really just donate, like for the person. There are some like maybe give, but I donate's pretty much the strongest call to action. Like we all know what that means. So primary info, what are you donating to? People want to know that. That's kind of important. Um, the minimum info you need to collect, very similar to e-commerce because you need their name, billing address, and the credit card payment info. You probably don't need the shipping address unless there's a gift or something tangible involved. But usually minimum just to collect money, that's all you need. Secondary messaging, there's a lot in donating secondary messaging. The emotional appeal, um, specific results or numbers or stats of the thing that you are doing, um, whether or not they are getting gifts, um, if it is a recurring donation, what is the period, but that is all supplemental to like what are you donating to. Some barriers and stuff. Um, people want to know where their money is going, so if they don't know where it's going, that's a barrier. Um, if you are giving gifts um, or asking for people to do something, um, the dollar amount level should be proportional to those gifts. For example, it's sometimes better to say like, donate $100 and you'll get this t-shirt than it is to say like, pay $100 for this t-shirt and 100% of the proceeds go to charity. Like it's the same thing, but people feel like, I'm not paying $100 for a t-shirt, but they will be like, sweet free t-shirt if I donate. Like it's the same, it's the same thing, but you wanna make sure your calls to action are proportional. Um, the decisions, not options, and anchoring. Anchoring is basically where people will make decisions on everything else they see based on the first thing they see. And so if you want to get more money from people, showing them a higher number first will make the lower numbers seem way more reasonable and therefore they will be likely to donate. And then giving people like donation amounts is often really useful also uh, because then they are more likely to pick one of those rather than typing in something that might be lower. Um, Red Cross is actually super good at this. Uh, this particular slider promo was kind of weird because they, they are saying shop now. Uh, it actually takes you to the donate page. But before this, it actually had like a red donate call to action button, donate, donate, donate all over the place. Um, yeah, so it was it was actually pretty good. I, I, I wish they hadn't had this, this holiday banner though because that just ruined the whole like, I know what I came here to do. I didn't come here to shop, I just wanna give you money. Um, Anything else exciting or not exciting about this? Yes. Oh, I was going to ask a good question. Yes. You know, like on the new restaurant things where you can do the slider bar for your tip? Yep. Do they have anything like that for donations with the slider bar that will show, like, results under? As a matter of fact, um, Akismet specifically has that okay. specific functionality. Lots of other things have stuff like that. But I can just think of Akismet because it goes from sad face to happy face. <laughs> like, sad face, you didn't give us any money. Happy face, all your money. Yeah, so... <laughs> That, but I mean, there, there are other examples. Um, 
This, though, is actually a pretty pretty solid donate page. And I mean, Red Cross, I would hope, is good at this. They're anchoring you with $500 is the first thing you read. Um, so by the time you get to 30, you're like, yeah, let's do that. Um, or you can type in your own. Uh, they give you a minimum. This is a drop menu. Again, easier to read, not on a projector, where it says three things. Where it's needed most, it says like disaster relief, and it says my local community. So it's like really clear exactly where your donation is going. It's do you want to make this recurring? Do you want to dedicate it? And then based on the payment method you select, you have a form on the bottom. If you select this, you have your form to fill out your information. If you fill out, select one of the other ones, it goes to the third party thing. You don't have to fill anything out again. So this is actually pretty super streamlined. Like, good job, Red Cross. You're pretty good at getting people's money. Um, <laughs> Another smaller example is GoFundMe, which is where people can set up their own individual donation pages for a cause. Um, this is a friend of mine, Julie Kuhl, who was raising money to take a class in WordPress development so she could be able to like make enough money on her own to like be a WordPress developer. Super successful, uh, went really well, the, co the community went in. Um, good things, super, like there's your donate button, it's right there. Less good thing, it's the same exact color as their secondary call to action. I would have done that a little bit different. I get why share on Facebook is important, but it's not as important as give me money. Um, other than that, like, is there anything good, bad, otherwise? I know we're just like tired and hot and want to get out of here, and you want me to stop talking. Yeah. I always thought it was very interesting with um, GoFundMe how they have they have like the slider for donating, but it looks really compelling when it's not quite full. But then once it is full, you're like, well, that sucks. You're um, you're good. Yep. You're done. Yep. Yeah, this thing, uh, if, if you haven't quite, it's a little incentivizing. If you haven't donated everything, it kind of shows you proportion until they get to whatever the goal is. So this is actually goal-based uh, as opposed to the Red Cross, which is just open donation. Um, when you get to the donate page, this is also a pretty good, like, super clear call. Like, type in how much you want to donate. It's not anchoring you with anything, but they're assuming you have a more personal connection to whatever it is you're donating to. I mean, like, you know exactly what's going to happen. There's only a couple fields you have to fill in. And then when you hit continue, you fill in your payment information. Only one downside is I would have liked to continue to like let me know that I was going to enter my payment information next. That would be nice just to know where I am in the process. But they did minimize the amount of fields that they are collecting, and they are progressively showing them as you get to a stage where you're committing. Um, last example on this is a WordPress plugin called Give. Um, super cool. Their demo site, if you use it, you can actually do donations on their demo site, and it goes to Girl Develop It, which is a super great national program promoting women learning coding. I'm a, I am a, involved in the Minneapolis chapter. Um, but so Give is just a, a super basic plugin that allows you to add donations to your site. It's really good. Um, basically, they have a lot of different front end interfaces. Here's the most basic one. Type in a price, donate now. When you donate now, you either um, hook it up to your PayPal or whatever other part, uh, payment processes they're doing and just do it. And that is the only steps that exist in Give. So that is pretty frictionless. There are other, um, on this page there's other things you can let people select different payment levels if you want to. There's more complex stuff. But uh, I would I would just like go look at it. I couldn't show all the different ones. But it's, it's a pretty slick little integration and follows a lot of good design patterns. Consistency in their buttons and all that stuff. So that was fun and really warm. Uh, this is <laughs> this is me. This is where you can find me. This is the link to my slides. They're also going to be sharing them on the WordCamp Orlando site. Um, I will be around to answer questions the rest of the weekend, but I won't make you guys stay in here because I am just, it is, I mean, I know it's Florida, but goodness. Um, but thank you for coming and have a good after party. Yay! Mm -hmm.